This is actually the thing I have to use the microphone because I don't like to. And what I'm talking about today is comfort zones. Wow, this is really loud. Um, so, obviously, you know, I had like, what, about 30 minutes to prepare a message today? So, I was like driving all the way here and I was like, all right, Lord, what am I going to talk about? Because, you know, I'm used to being back in the back with the kids. And you can hear it though. I mean, I can hear myself super loud. Um, so anyway, I was like, I'm usually back in the back with the kids and... You know, to be honest with you, that's kind of gotten to be a really big comfort zone for me now because I don't have to talk to any of y'all. You know, I see you for five minutes, you drop your kids off, you pick them up, boom, I'm done. But, um, so I was driving up and I said, Lord, what am I going to talk about? And I actually have like two or three different things that I had written down in the past, um, but I just didn't feel like that was it. And I felt like comfort zones is something that we all kind of... I mean, we all have our own comfort zones. And so I get here and I'm kind of trying to figure out, okay, so how do I take comfort zones and make a message out of it in less than 30 minutes? So y'all are blessed to get to hear this today. <laughs> so anyway, Brittany, I told her what I was talking about. She's like, I shared this thing on Facebook and it's awesome. And this little um, graphic here, I was like, we can, we can work with that. So, um, the comfort zone is obviously in the middle, and that's where you feel safe and in control. So I know that y'all don't like to talk, but y'all get to today. So who wants to tell me like their best comfort zone, like where you feel the most comfortable at? Home. Don't everybody raise your hand at once. Home. Home? Yeah. Why are you sitting on the back row, Joey? Because I was late getting here. I didn't want to interrupt my <laughs> <laughs> So why are you most comfortable at home? Why do you feel like you're most comfortable at home? I mean, you can be your true self at home. You're not worried about impressing anybody at home. You're not worried about any judgment, being judged or anything like that at home. It's just, that's your place. See, I feel the same way about my mom's house. Not my house, just my mom's. Okay. What about you, Aaron? You raised your hand earlier. Yeah, at home. I'm in bed asleep. <laughs> <laughs> anybody have a comfort zone other than home? Mm -hmm. I do at church because I feel like when I'm in church, I don't worry about anything else that's going on. I feel so comfortable just sitting and knowing that God's with me, and I don't have to worry about none of the other stuff. Not even my home. I ain't got to worry about it right now. I'm worried about what the Lord wants me to have. Okay. I feel safest at work because I know what I'm doing and know what's around me. I'm prepared for everything. All the hazards or whatever that are at the job site. So, I would say for me that's where I've been throughout the majority of you know like you're most comfortable where you're confident. You know, like if you were starting, to, I mean, like when you were starting your brand new job, with I mean, you know, I mean, until you got confident with it, you probably wasn't as comfortable as say you are now, right? right. You know, so for me, confidence <laughs> is very you know you're, you're comfortable where you're most confident. So. In this thing, it says, in the comfort zone, you feel safe and in control. And so, when you look at that as the, into the kingdom, you know, why do we not go out into the world and share the gospel? I mean, who, who shared the gospel with somebody this week? So, why didn't you? Anybody? Well, what's your definition of sharing the gospel? Well, I mean, like, you know, Pretty much anything. Anything that would open the door to let somebody know about Jesus or let somebody know about what he's done for you. Any, anything to that extent. Sorry. Mr. Merritt and his wife Loretta, who was the greeter lady at the Bank of Loosedale for 50 years, they're both down on their health. I called them and said, told them I'd say a prayer for them this weekend. And Asked him how he was, how Miss Loretta was. So anybody else? I mean, does what what holds us back from doing stuff like that more often? I'm just scared someone's gonna like judge what you say and the way you say it. I don't know. That's for me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna like get nervous and say like the wrong thing. What happens if you do? 
then I'm scared they might be like, oh, that's a ridiculous uh, belief, you know, not want anything to do with Christ. Or God. So. I mean, like for me, like right now, having to, every, the, the, y'all, a lot of people don't know me personally, but I'm probably extremely, or I consider myself extremely introverted. Speaking in front of people is very, like, not in my comfort zone. Talking with the microphone is definitely not in my comfort zone. But I was determined I was going to kind of make myself do it, and then I tried to chicken out at the last minute. But then, then you was on the news. You can do this. Remember when we was in Louisiana? They did that interview with you. That's why it's not my comfort zone. See, but you can do it. it. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but the thing is, is sometimes, you know, in order to, I, I wrote down what I felt like the Lord wanted me to talk about it said comfort zones and daring greatly and so I wish I would have had like more time to like really prepare and then like to go in from the back into here it's kind of like anyway I feel like everything's kind of jumbled at the moment but daring greatly you know and so we're going to talk about Peter and we went and we had a whole bunch of other examples in the Bible but we kind of ended up on Peter because Peter did he dared greatly what's one of the best things that Peter's known for in the Bible, anybody specifically? Like, how are you supposed to interact here? Walk on water. So Peter walked on water. Brittany knows the message because she helped me come up with it. <laughs> but um, okay, so turn to Acts. I mean Matthew 14, verse 22. I'm going to try to read this, but I can't see it. So we'll see how that goes. So immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now on the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So Jesus said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him, and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So we were looking at this story, and we were looking at this graphic, and for Peter, you know, to start with, he was comfortable in the boat. It would have been easy to stay in the boat. And so, so the next little slide is fear. And that's like the fear zone. And when you look at the thing, it, I mean, it says a lot of things that we just said. You know, lack of self-confidence. You know, in this zone is where you find excuses and you're affected by others' opinions. We heard all of that. Everybody said, well, I, you know, what if they judge me? What if they think I'm saying the wrong thing? And we let these fears and our lack of confidence stop us from stepping out into daring greatly for the kingdom and daring greatly for Jesus. You know, like, and I think about this lack of self-confidence. I mean, Jesus with Peter, when, when we, we wrote down here that in the fear area, you know, for Jesus, Jesus looked at Peter and he just said one word, come. You know, so Peter had to have confidence in one word, a one word call. You know, that hey, if Jesus said one word to me, then I can make it there. I can walk on the water, you know. And so that self-confidence that I can do whatever Jesus tells me to do, you know, he had to get through the fear zone in order to be able to do that. And then we would, we were thinking, you know, like, Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and that's, you can find that in Isaiah 9 and 6. And if he is the Prince of Peace, then there should be nothing, because the way that I looked at this when we first started was Jesus is over here on the other side of this area. And so we're here in our comfort zone, but we should be trying to get over there to where he is, because where he is, great things happen. 
you know. And so, but to get there, we have to go through these other zones. Is basically, basically what we're talking about here. So, my question is too: Is it self confidence? But also, how confident are we in Jesus Himself? You know, like if He tells us to do something, then are we confident enough that we can walk on the water? We can go across the street and share the gospel. We can, you know, pray for somebody and expect them to be healed. You know, all of these different things, if we have confidence in who Jesus even is. You know, forget our own confidence. We have to have confidence in him first. And so then, the next part that I have is the learning phase. And so, in this part, you know, we have to learn to trust, you know, that... Whatever Jesus says that we can do, we can do. Jesus looked, and I mean, how many times do we sit back and say, well, should I do that or not do that? Well, <coughs> if I knew for sure that I heard Jesus, you know, if I knew for sure he told me to do it. I mean, this was one word. I mean, imagine that Peter, he's a fisherman. He's comfortable in the boat. I mean, that was his job, you know, who he was before he became a disciple. He's comfortable in the boat. <laughs> And we're comfortable in our church, not going outside the walls and doing anything. You know, this could be our boat. You know, we might be saved here. We might be safe from the storm. We might be safe from drowning. But what if this is our boat? And all we need to do is step outside of it and brave, brave walking on water to go out and do something great. Because all those other guys sat in the boat, but they didn't get to experience what Peter experienced. I mean, he got a walk that no man else has ever got. He got to walk on water because he was able to step out. You know, I mean, he just looked up and said, I heard him say, come, I'm going. You know, I mean, how often do we do that? I mean, it's like a, to me, that's been like my goal in life. And I, I know most of y'all probably don't know a whole lot of my story, but, I mean, I am a, my mama could tell you, I used to would not even ask somebody where something was at Walmart. I would walk around for hours because I was that shy and that introverted that I wouldn't even think about going and doing anything. I mean, even just simple. But there was something about when I heard Jesus say go and do something, I mean, I've let him take me all around the world. And I got to experience some of the most awesome, what I would consider water walking experiences, but only because I was willing to step out of the boat and go. You know, if I, if I drown, I mean, if I die, if, I mean, I, I mean I, I've almost died, you know, quite often doing some of the things that I felt like the Lord's called me to do. But I've also got to experience some of the most awesome, life-changing things for me and for other people just because I stepped out of the boat. So, I've learned to hear his voice and know when he says to go. And that's a, that's a process and it's a learning thing. You don't, everybody don't just automatically start. I mean, Peter, in a minute we're going to look at the life of Peter and some of the stuff that he went through. So, it's a, it's a learning process. It's not something that you just have to start doing today, you know. I mean, you're going to sink sometimes. You're going to have to be saved by him. But eventually, you're going to get to have that walking on water experience. So, and another thing that he learned in that learning zone from Peter's story is he learned not to look at the circumstances that are around him. You know, the minute that he started looking at the waves and he started looking at the water and he started looking at everything else, he questioned that call. You know, and for us, we can't question the call. And the call for us, if you don't know, is to go and make disciples. You know, if I ask, you know, how many of y'all feel like you're a disciple? Does anybody feel like they're a disciple? You know? But you're not only called to be a disciple, you're called to be a disciple maker. You know? Every single person in the church was called. We, I mean, we're called to go out and disciple nations. You know? So, I mean, we know the call. But if we start looking around at our circumstances, we question it, and then nothing ever happens, and people die and go to hell because we didn't 
step out of the boat. I mean, that's ultimately what it comes down to. This is heaven or hell, eternity with God or eternity away from him for a nation. You know, I mean, we have, we have a big call. And it's for every single person in this room. You know, he didn't, I mean, I don't personally think he called any of us to just sit in the boat. You know, it's not somebody else's job to go out and disciple the nations. That's, that's our call. And so, if we look at it, I mean, how easy is it to, I mean, like, like Shayla said earlier, to say, well, if I say something, they're going to think I'm dumb. Or what if they say, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. Or, I mean, if they do, then oh well. You know, I mean, you learn how to say it better the next time. You know, I mean, it's really that simple. And so, then the last thing that we felt like when we were reading the story about Peter is that he learned that Jesus would catch him. You know, and that's a, that's a big thing. To be able to step out in faith to do anything at all if you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is going to catch you if you screw it all up, then what is there to fear? You know, I mean, there's absolutely nothing to fear if you know that he's going to catch you anyway. So that's pretty much the learning phase. If you want to add anything to it, you can. It seems like it had a lot more <laughs> early when we were talking about it. All right, so the next phase then is the growth zone. And the growth zone, obviously, you know, is like where we feel like you get the most freedom and, you know, things happen in the growth zone. You know, you're not quite exactly where you need to be, but you're, you know, you set new goals, find a purpose, you know, live your dreams. And all of this goes for regular life along with the, you know, but for me, it's, I mean, it's church, so it's kind of like, all right, how, how does this affect the kingdom, you know? And so the growth phase here, you know, is purpose. So Peter, and for some of y'all, I don't, I don't know exactly where y'all are as far as the Bible, but Peter was this, he was kind of a hothead, to be honest with you. I mean, he got in trouble with Jesus probably more than some of the other disciples. I mean, he was always... You know, he was, he was kind of cocky, I think, when you read the stories. I mean, if you, if you haven't read the Gospels, go through and read. I mean, Jesus called him Satan. I mean, he's like, get behind me, Satan, you know. And they're like, who's going to be the greatest among your disciples? You know, I mean, he was just this kind of cocky dude or whatever. And we also know. Mm -hmm. The reason why I took Aaron back there to say, guys, there's a video of you, the whole time you've been talking. I wanted to say something about it. I don't want to speak up out of here. But it's a video that Will Smith did <coughs> talking about fear. Basically the same thing what you're talking about, but he describes it in a different way. So I took Aaron back there, see if he knew what it is, and he's going to play it. That's okay. Yeah, cool. I like Will Smith a lot. <laughs> so Peter, when we get to Peter... Let's see, a couple of things about Peter. One, he denied Jesus. I mean, one minute he's walking with Jesus and he's like, hey, Jesus like, hey, who do you say that I am? You know, and Peter's like, well, some people say this and some people say that, but I say you're the Christ. And so Jesus is like, wow, you know, I'm going to change your name. You're now Revelation, you know. So Peter's like, on cloud nine, like, I'm awesome. And then he's like, well, I would never deny you. And then we know what he does. Three times he denies Jesus. You know, when Jesus needed him the most, Peter denies him. You know, so I mean, he's definitely not this perfect guy by any means. But he did step out of the boat and he did walk on water. And he kept following Jesus even when he screwed up. I mean, and, I mean, like we said, Jesus looked and said, get behind me, Satan. You know, I mean, how would that make you feel if Jesus himself called you Satan, you know, I would be like, all right, I'm done, I'm obviously not cut out for this, I'm going back to fish, but he kept on, he was persistent for sure, so when we see the thing about purpose, so Peter denies Jesus, he's in fear, and you can't blame him, I mean, he's in the garden, 
you know, they come for Jesus. Peter grabs his sword, he chops off the dude's ear, then he gets in trouble again, and he's like, dude, you know, put your sword away. You know, do you want to live and die by that? So he gets in trouble with Jesus, then Jesus gets hauled away, and he runs from the garden, he ends up denying Jesus three times. I mean, it was like a servant girl. Asked Peter, are you one of his disciples? He's like, uh-uh, I'm not his disciple. You know, I mean, what's a servant girl going to do? But he was, he was that afraid. So he denies Jesus three times. Then Jesus is crucified. And then he tells him, you know, like, hey, y'all go and wait for the Holy Spirit to come. The Holy Spirit comes. Peter gets the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the next day, it says that he stood up. You know, one minute he's hiding, he's cowering, he's... Um, denying Jesus, and then the next we see he stands up and he preaches a message on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 people got saved. You know, so he goes from this, you know, from, from one, one thing to another, and then for goals, you know, I mean, like, to be the guy who understands who Jesus is before anybody else. And for Jesus himself to say, all right, I'm going to build my church on you. I mean, that's a pretty good goal, in my opinion, you know. And then um, he's later on, he's walking through town, and he gets to the temple gate. And you can find this story in Acts, like, 3 through 11. And they see a guy that's there, and he's begging for alms, and he's lame. And, you know, up until this point, his whole entire life, somebody had to carry him to the gate and lay him there where he would lay all day long and beg for money. And then at the end of the day, somebody would have to come and get him and carry him home. I mean, that was his, that was this guy's life. And so Peter, they, they walk by him, and the guy asked for money. And then, you know, we kind of know this little story. It just seems like a little quick Sunday school thing. But Peter says, well, silver and gold I don't have. But what I do have, I'm going to give to you. Rise up and walk. And so that story... If Peter hadn't walked on water, Peter had a walk that no man other than Jesus had. And he was able to give a walk to another man. You know, like if he wouldn't have walked on water, would he have had that walk to give to somebody else? And then he raises Tabitha from life, from death to life. That's in Acts 9, 32, 43. Um, he was sent to Cornelius, so basically he brought the gospel to the Gentiles. I mean, we wouldn't even have the gospel if Peter wouldn't have brought it to us. Um, that's Acts 10, 1 through 48. Um, he speaks to the council of Jerusalem, like a leadership council, you know. So here's a man who was, and all when you look at his life, and especially his walk with Jesus, he kind of looked like a screw-up a lot of times, you know. He got in a lot of trouble, and now he's telling other people at the Jerusalem council, you know, basically what the beliefs are and how, how, to, how to walk this Christian life. And so he basically went from his little comfort zone in the boat all the way through into growth. And we have the church, I mean, we're part of the church today because of the work that Peter did. And so I wrote down this scripture at 2 Corinthians 3.18, and it says that basically we're to go from glory to glory into the very image of God. So we have to go from one step to the next to the next until we also walk in the image of God. And so it's not just do you want to, you know, will you get out of your comfort zone? But in order to go from one glory to the next, we have to be willing to walk through some of these very things. And, you know, I, I was... When I was praying about this, I was thinking about, you know, like, sometimes we think that sharing the gospel is this scary thing and that I'm not equipped for it. But, you know, part of the point behind church is to equip the saints for the ministry of the gospel. You know, you don't just come here to listen to a quick message and go home. I mean, the reason why I know that Jason has been talking about we talk, he's been talking about nudges for 15 years, but a nudge is nothing more than just stepping out of the boat. I mean, that's really all. It, I mean, and it 
it can be scary. I mean, but, I mean, that's that's the ministry of the gospel. You know, if we're not actually equipping y'all to do that, then we're wasting our time. You know, so, um, I really didn't think about how I was going to necessarily end this. <laughs> <coughs> but we can watch Joe's thing. Maybe that'll be, uh, maybe that'll be what we need to kind of end it. Real quick, you know, hey, 
And I feel like the Lord called me to go over to Nepal if anybody would like to partner with me. So it was easy for me to say yes to start with because, I mean, I think we were probably broker than we had ever been broke in our life. We had no money. You know, how am I going to get on the airplane and fly over to Nepal and, you know, do all this kind of stuff? It was easy to say yes when there was like, kind of had the thought process of like, there's no way that I'm going to actually make it. But I did the, you know, obligatory thing. I put it on fact Because I told the Lord, I was actually in my bathtub. That's usually when he speaks to me. You know, it's when you have this, like, downtime and you're not really even thinking about anything. And all of a sudden, he has a chance to, like, jump into your brain and be like, okay. And so I said, well, okay, Lord, I'll go. But you're going to have to work a miracle because I have no money to get to Nepal. So I put on Facebook, real gentle, you know, just a little quick thing. Hey, I would like to go to Nepal. If anybody wants to partner with me, that'd be awesome. And I had one lady that said, I'll sponsor you $100. And then another lady says, hey, I'll sponsor $100. And I was like, awesome, $200. And the flight's like $1,500, not counting all the other expenses. So it's like, okay, awesome. And then I get a phone call from another lady, and she said, are you serious about going to Nepal? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, then come to my house. I've got some money to give you. And she had been out of church. She was a lady, sweet, sweet lady. She had gotten hurt in church, and she didn't have anywhere to go, but she knew that she was supposed to tithe, so she had been putting her tithes in a coffee can for years. And she handed me basically the full amount that I needed to go. And within, within 24 hours, I was fully, 100% completely funded. So then it hit me, you know, like Will Smith had that, like, oh, my God, I got home and I got in the bed, and it's like, oh, you know, I'm going to really do this. And so now I have a plane ticket, you know, and I'm going to fly halfway around the world by myself. You know, I've been to, like, Guatemala and Honduras, but I've never been across the sea. And um, Jason was working. He couldn't go, so it was literally just me, you know, that said, yes, I'll go. And... Um, I remember everybody saying, wow, you know, I, I, people would be like, I wish I was as brave as you are. And I'm like, I'm not really that brave. You know, like I'm shaking in my boots right now, but I want to be obedient. You know, if the Lord says to go, then I mean, I'm really, truly not brave. I've done a lot of stuff and I've experienced a lot of stuff, but I'm not a brave person and I'm a shy person and I'm a, you know, all of these different things that I, I feel like I am, but that's not necessarily who the Lord sees. Because he obviously sees somebody that can get on a plane and fly across the ocean and go take care of people in an earthquake and somehow make it back home again. You know, I mean, I didn't know. You're talking about going through the airports where you don't speak the language and it's just you by yourself, you know. And so I get on the plane and to be honest with you, I got more lost in New York airport than I did in any of the other countries because the New York people were the least helpful out of everybody. <laughs> but I get on the plane, we get into the country, we drive up into this village, we get dropped off in the middle of, I mean, way up in the Himalayan mountains. And um, our first goal was to bring water back to the village and we carried pipe up there and we got water back to the village. and. Um, all week we spent with this little tiny percentage of Christian people. Um, and, you know, I knew that there was persecution in the world, but I didn't realize the persecution that Hindu and Buddhist people, I mean, partake in. They're extremely um, violent to Christians. And so we're at this little tiny Christian church where there's probably like 10 Christians in the whole village. And we're surrounded by um, by very, very radical Hindus. And so all week, I felt like we didn't really do as much as I thought we were going to do when we were there. And then the, the day we were going to leave, another earthquake happened. I barely survived, you know. But um, I got rescued out by a helicopter, and it's just like, awesome miracle story, you know, and for me, that one trip sums up all of this for myself, you know, it would have been easy for me to say, no, I'm comfortable here in Loosedale, you know, and there's stuff I can do in Loosedale, and that's absolutely true, I've had more of a 
mission field across the street than I do anywhere else in the world. There's a mission field here. I'm not saying you have to get on a plane, but you have to be willing to get out of your comfort zone. And I, you know, I could have stayed here. And I did have to go through the fear zone. I mean, the night before I left, you know, it, I mean, like, the fear was there. And it was very real, and it would have been very easy to find a hundred reasons to stay home. You know, my husband's out of town working. Connor was still in school. My mom had to come up and stay with him. You know, I mean, I could have come up with hundreds and hundreds of reasons. Brittany was pregnant and had a terrible, I mean, Sometimes I wondered if she was going to live, you know, because her blood pressure was so high. I mean, I could have literally, like, come up with a whole bunch of reasons to stay home that I could have let that fear stop me from stepping out, you know. And then I learned a lot. I mean, the whole, once I got past the fear, I learned, you know, that Jesus is going to be there, you know. I mean, I was, I mean, I was in a major, major earthquake and barely, lived like I was seconds away from death and I had to figure out how to get home and there was a no I mean there's no helicopters because they're rescuing out people that are hurt and I prayed a little prayer and I was like Lord I just don't think I can go down the mountain in the back of a truck because that's where everybody was getting killed in the rock slides trying to get you know on the roads and within like five minutes of praying that prayer, this helicopter drops down, picks us up. We only we didn't even get to bring our supplies. We had to just bring our passport and us and leave. And later on when I, you know, we get home and life kind of gets back to normal, we find out that um, in the middle of all of this chaos, the a lady, the group that we were with had a group that got together and they prayed overnight for us. And this one lady, they said that she stood up and she started saying, I declare in the name of Jesus that there isn't a shortage of helicopters. I declare in the name of Jesus that there is no shortage of helicopters. And they said she just said that over and over. And so when we backtrack the time difference from there to here, and it was exactly that time that she stood up and started saying, you know, that she declared there's no shortage of helicopters was when that helicopter happened to fly over our village and see our little, we made a, little thing out of rocks that said Chaku and because I mean you're there's no these little villages there's no like coordinates and there are probably a hundred villages named Chaku and so they didn't even know where to find us and so we took the rocks it's kind of like something that you see on the movies and we spelled out Chaku real big so it could be seen from the sky and then the village people came brought some flour so that we could put them over top of the rocks and make it, you know, where it would be white, where they would see it. And then the goats in the village came and ate all the flour off the rocks, you know. <laughs> but we found out that when the, the leader, the guy that was our leader, you know, that wasn't with us in the village, was in the office trying to get us a helicopter, the um, mic got left open. And so all of the helicopter pilots was hearing their conversation. And he was saying, well, they're in a little village named Chaku. And so he, um, this one, because the mics got left open, and they were telling him there's no, there's no helicopters. There's no helicopters unless they're hurt. And so, oh, look at there. Aaron's done found my little pictures. <laughs> oh, well, look, that's my little thing that I, I made. So that's kind of cool. I didn't even know you could find those. Um, after the gates ate the flower off. And so the, the mic got left open and the helicopter pilot just happened to look down and wave their arms. And we waved our arms and he landed and we got picked up. And before I knew it, one minute I was in the village and the next minute I was on the plane heading home. And you know, that's a miracle story. And that's for me, one of those kind of things where when life is terrible or something else is coming you know, from the enemy that just feels like it's a, it just seems impossible. I have this story to look back on. I mean, I can pull up this picture and see these rocks and know that Jesus is going to reach out his hand, you know, and he's going to be there. You know, but you don't learn that outside, I'm telling you. You can't learn these lessons in your comfort zone. You really, really can't. You have to, I mean, you can kind of have an idea that he'll be there, but when, he, when you have these 
miracle type stories is because you stepped past that fear and you stepped past that burning phase and you got into the growth phase. And then the growth phase is where you really truly know who you are and who he is. And that's how you get that confidence. And the confidence is what you need to stay out of the comfort zone, truthfully. And it's real easy to step back into a comfort zone. You know, you step out one time, I mean, Peter stepped out one time, and then the next time he denied. And then, you know, he stepped out into this comfort zone, he'd done this for Jesus, and then, you know, but he still denied Jesus, you know what I mean? But then at the very end, you know what I mean, he basically brought us the gospel. So, that's pretty much the end of what I got. If anybody else has anything else that they want to add. Debbie, you got anything you want to add? I will say, too, that it's really important to just keep stepping out because just the disaster missions in general, because that's where a lot of my miracle stories come from. Um, I remember one of our first deployments where I kind of took a leadership position, and it went terrible. It was the worst feeling of my entire life. I really thought that I was going to get all this food and we were not going to have anything because I was overly helpful to this lady. And I didn't step out again for a long time. And then we went to North Carolina and in the process I had never pulled a trailer before in my life. And I pulled a trailer and we get not even an hour away and we have a blowout. And Aaron was there, so I could have sent him and just gave up, but I didn't, and I got back from the driver's seat because Kim couldn't fit there. <laughs> and, um, That's great. I, <laughs> I was too short because we had so much stuff in there. And so I drove, and I went through Atlanta traffic, at 5 o'clock traffic. Uh, you know, I mean, I drove, and I went to North Carolina, and then I got confidence there because I know without a doubt that I'm going to see a man in heaven one day that may or may not have been there all over a meal that was keto friendly because he was on keto, you know. And we saw so many miracles, and I was dealing with so much turmoil and fear in my life with Aaron. It was a really bad time for us. Anxiety was just taking over our family, and it was really bad, and I could have chosen to just say no. I had to rekindle between, I think, four different people while I was gone. And um, <clears throat> there were so many reasons that I could have not went, but I gained the confidence there that later I stepped out and done my own deployment without him, without knowing that I was going to have anybody, because he was going to have me, and hopefully somebody would come join, you know. And it's all of that's where you find your miracles, and that's where you find your growth, is whenever you'll actually say yes, despite literally everything going wrong. And so just keep stepping out, because... You might fall and you might sink the first time like Peter did, but Jesus reaches out and he does catch you. And I think that that's the point that really, I don't know, I think that's the point that stuck out to me was that, because I looked at him and I was like, he went on a one word call. Like, I'm that person that like God's going to have to be like, okay, Brittany, I want you to go here and do this and this and, you know, not really because I went on a no word call before, but... But, you know, I mean, he went on a one-word call. And just the importance of really, really know the call and know that God does speak to you. That it's not, it, you just, you have to know. you got to get to that point where you just know. And that's whenever you're going to find the growth. Well, a couple of quick stories, and Jason will probably still tell you all the same story because he, um, you know, it's his story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. So, because it is a pretty cool story. He um, went to Atlanta with Naomi and Tim a couple of weeks ago to pick up a lawnmower. It was after her dad had died, and they inherited a lawnmower and some other stuff. And so Jason drove them up there. And while they were there, they stopped at a gas station on the way home, and he saw this guy. And if you saw him, I mean, he looked like, I don't know how to, Devin can probably describe him better than me. I've only seen a picture. But he looks like a thug gang. He looks like Post Malone, if anybody knows who that is. Does anybody know who Post Malone yeah. is? Yeah. Anyway, he looked like a little, like a, not somebody you would 
just necessarily go up and talk to in a you know big city or whatever. But Jason felt like the Lord said to go and um, pray with him. So Jason walked up to the guy and he's like, hey, you know, blah, 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 my name's Jason. And I don't know the full extent of that whole first conversation, but Jason did pray with him. And he came home and he, he told me about him. I mean, it was one of those kind of things where he knew that the, he was like, I think I might have went all the way to Atlanta just to pray with this one guy. And so he gets home and, you know, life goes back to normal. Then um, Naomi's sister, while they were there the first time, he actually prayed for Naomi's sister. She felt like her, she was going to have to have a knee replaced. And then she ended up not having to have a knee replacement. And so then Naomi's dad dies and the sister, her sister just got diagnosed with breast cancer. And so Jason, last Sunday when he said, would you drive across the country if the Lord told you to? That was because that was what the Lord had told him to do earlier in the day. He felt like he was supposed to drive to Atlanta and pray for this lady, you know. And he was like, okay, well, I'm going to drive to Atlanta. So he gets up, and Devin decides to ride with him, and they go to Atlanta. They literally drive all the way there. I think they spent, what, about 10 minutes praying for Maybe 10 minutes praying for her sister, and you know, I mean, and he's thinking all this time that he's there because of the sister, you know, like he that that was why the Lord told him to go to Atlanta. And so, apparently, they're driving back home, they stop at a gas station, I don't even know if it was the same one, and here's this guy again. And so, Jason goes and prays and talks to him again, and was like, Hey, I don't know if you remember me, and you might have more of the conversation. Were you there for like the yeah, yeah, we are. Uh... Pulled into the gas station. He had been in his restaurant. Um, and so he pulled into the gas station. He's like, this is, a, this is the same place where I met that guy. He was telling me that story. He said, this is kind of that same place. And we walked into the barber shop next door. And sure enough, there he was cutting hair. Um, and when we say barber shop, it's kind of a, um, if I could use the word ghetto barber shop, that's what it was. Um, and we walked in, and you know, two, two white guys, Totally not supposed to be there at all. Definitely not a comfort here. zone, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely out of the comfort zones. And we walk in and everybody just kind of turns and they're like, uh, are you lost? And that, that we didn't even get a can we help you. It was an are you lost uh, type deal. And Jason seen it and he just ran over and started talking to him. And, um, I mean, they started talking like old friends just because of the, the previous encounter that they had. Uh, he was already open to the place and already willing to talk to him. Hey, what in the world, man? Um, so, so they start talking and he says, well, man, can I pray with you before we, before we head out? And he said, yeah. I've, ever, ever since you prayed with me last time, um, things have been just looking up for me. So I would, I would love for your prayer. And we walked outside and we, we prayed and uh, just we asked him, uh, what, what do you want us to pray for? And he said, man, let's pray for your family. And it was totally unselfish. And he said, let's pray for your family and your family. Uh, so Jason said, okay, well, let's pray for him and the church and uh, my wife and everybody. So we did. Um, and then we prayed for his. And afterwards, do you mind if I finish? Yeah, go ahead. And after that, he kind of... Um, Jason said, let me, let me ask you something. Do you know this guy named Jesus? Like, have you ever heard the gospel? We live in America, so I know everybody knows. And he says, well, my, my family was raised in church, but I, I've really never, I don't know the story. I know the name Jesus, but I, don't, I really don't know what happened. To me, that's a shock, living in America. Uh, who doesn't know the story of the cross? Um, and so... Basically, Jason gave him a, a rundown of it and um, told him the gospel and, and said, that's it, man. That's, all you have to do is confess your sins and, and believe on him. And, um, and at that point, he's, he is your Lord. He's your Savior. And you just have to be obedient to him no matter what it looks like. And so he, at, that, at that point, he said, now, I, I would have And so he gave his life to Christ right there at that moment prayed with us and uh, turned everything around right there. And I, I believe, I, I really believe that's the whole reason that we were sent to Atlanta that day was to randomly fall in contact with him.
Yeah. And what's really cool is Jason, Jason comes home and apparently he friended Jason on Facebook. Yeah. And because Jason had told me, he said he was a rapper, you know, or whatever. And so Jason looks him up and he's like got tons of music. I mean, it's not, y'all probably wouldn't necessarily want to listen to it, but he's got tons of music all over Spotify and stuff. And um, Jason's like, this dude might be famous, you know. And so then the next day, um, after he's, you know, friends with the guy, the guy sends him a message and is like, I just want to thank you so much for sharing Jesus with me. And he was like, my life is, I, my life just feels totally and completely different. And he was like, I can just feel the blessing of the Lord just already, you know. And so it's kind of like, I mean, to me, Jay, I can tell you right now that there is absolutely nothing special about Jason. <laughs> You know, he's just a normal, he's just a normal, but he's just, there, there's nothing more special about him than y'all, I guess is the point that I'm making. You know, there's, except that he was obedient, you know, he drove, he got in the car and he drove to Atlanta because the Lord told him to, you know, and so one day he's going to stand in heaven with Q-tip, <laughs> you know, I don't know what his real name, I was trying to think of what his real name was. You know, with Q-tip, there with him, you know, because he got in the car and he drove to Atlanta, you know, and, and I mean, even more awesome, you know, Miss Naomi's sister might be healed. I mean, we, we don't know the whole story with that part yet or not, you know, but I mean, it's just that easy, you know, but it would have been, I mean, I can tell you right now, we had a week from hell that went on the enemy was coming against us like you would not even believe this last week we had um you know tons of i mean he's right in the middle of a, a job that he could have said well i have to you know i have to do this job and i think about even talking about that reminds me of like the feast you know that jesus called you know the, there's a story of the feast and he called everybody to come and they didn't show up you know and some of them said well i have a job that i need to do well, I have a field that I need to plow. Well, my mother-in-law is sick. You know, all these different reasons to not go to the feast, you know. But I can tell you for Jason for sure and probably for Devin, leading that man to Christ in a barber shop in Atlanta was the feast. You know, that was probably, that's something that you can live off of for months, you know. Because, I mean, there's nothing better, I can tell you. If you've never, if you've never led somebody to Christ, there's literally like nothing better. Because you're, I mean, imagine if there was somebody dead here and I prayed for them and they rose up from the dead, that'd be awesome. But you're talking about raising somebody from the dead for eternity. I mean, there's nothing better than that in the world that could ever compare to somebody is going to hell for eternity and now they get to spend heaven, I mean, the, the rest of their eternity with God in heaven and with you in heaven. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's like the, that's the feast to me, you know, but... So many times we stand around and we come up with all these excuses, you know. And all of the excuses, in all honesty, is fear. You know, it really is. It kind of comes down to, what if I drive to Atlanta and I pray for the lady and nothing happens? I know Jason had that thought. You know, and Q-tip wasn't even, that was almost like icing on the cake, you know what I mean? But then... Real quick, just another little thing, you know, I don't know if everybody knows, but the lady and man that own the rest of the hotel across the they don't own it, but they work there. Um, from day one, when we moved into this building, we looked over, and the Holy Spirit just, I mean, like, highlighted these people to me. And so I knew that we had to build a relationship with them. Well, the lady, they're both from India. They're um, practicing Hindus, and... She speaks no English at all. And I speak, I thought I spoke her language because I could say my name is Kim. And that was the extent of my speaking her language. Turns out she doesn't even speak Hindi. She speaks like another language. But anyway, um, so, but we, we were, I mean, and it, it, and it is not my comfort zone to just walk over and try to make conversation with people that I don't know. That really is not who I am. But we started going over and talking with them, and me and Brittany and Asley one evening went over and had tea with her that Brittany was like having to pray to be able to swallow because it was very, very thick tea. It wasn't like American tea, but um, 
then this last week, we went to a pastor's conference here in Loosedale, and we met one of the pastors at, from Shady Grove, and we were talking to him, and he, we were telling him about them, and he said, I have a missionary that's coming in from India um, next weekend. He was like, wouldn't it be awesome if we could get together and go over there, and that way he could translate for you, and I was like, that'd be great, because I mean, we've We've been spending time with this lady, and she'll talk for 10 minutes, and I'll smile, and then I'll talk for a few minutes, and she'll smile, and neither one of us know what the other is saying, and um, I've ate some really weird food, but that's, you know, also stepping out of the comfort zone, because I like chicken and mashed potatoes and gravy, <laughs> um, but so he meets me here yesterday morning, and we walk over and spend two hours with him and you could always tell when Leela would be talking about me or talking about Asley or Brittany just by the this like she would point to the couch like where we were sitting that day and stuff and he said um he, he probably told me probably 10 times he was like y'all have no idea what you have done just by befriending her she's never ever had a visitor she's been here for two years and she's never had a friend you know, and I'm and I'm thinking, she's she doesn't have Christ because she's a practicing Hindu. She doesn't have the peace that he has. She lives there in that hotel. She works in that hotel, and she's never had a single person befriend her in two years. You know, and he but I mean, and he probably told me 15 times. He said, he said you, she loves you, and she she she's telling me that she loves you and that you have changed her life, and he got to share a little bit of the gospel with her, and, you know, like, out of all of that, you know, I mean, it don't seem like that, I mean, it's not flying across the country or across the world to Nepal. It's right here in our yard. You know, it, it really isn't scary to step out of a comfort zone and change somebody's life right here in Loosedale, you know? I mean... Somebody changed yours. You're sitting in this room for a reason, you know. You can change that eternity for somebody else. But then be praying today because by having a translator, you know, I don't know what she's been telling me for the past three months, <laughs> but they were, she was telling him that there is another Indian lady that owns the Rocky Creek Inn and, or works at the Rocky Creek Inn, and her son just got killed in a car accident. And so I got him to ask Lila if she'd ever met her, and she, she's actually never met the lady, but she wanted to go and talk to her. And so I'm going to take Lila, and we're going to go after church up to the Rocky Creek Inn and probably meet another lady that's probably never had anybody that's dealing with, like, a major loss right now. So we don't know. We really don't know what one little step out of the boat might be. So this week, I would encourage you, you know, step out of the boat. You know, even, even if you hear one word, I mean, Peter heard come, and he stepped out of the boat. So even if you hear Walmart, go to Walmart, what do you have to lose? If you go to Walmart, and you walk around for an hour, and you never see anybody that looks like, okay, this is who I'm supposed to, you know, whatever, you know, I mean, if nothing else, if you can tell somebody, hey, you know what, Jesus really does love you and he has a purpose for your life. You know, I mean, it might be something as simple as that, but go, you know, because you don't know what you might get to experience.